cresci no interior de Minas Gerais, numa cidadezinha chamada São José do Buriti. É uma cidade muito pequena. Eu sou de Fortaleza, nascido e criado em Fortaleza. Estudava numa escola de bairro, depois mudei para uma escola maior. E eu tinha sonhos de estudar, muito porque minha mãe não tinha tido oportunidade de estudar. E ela sempre me incentivou muito. Eu sempre estudei em escolas públicas, né? Eu venho de uma família de baixa renda. É, ao longo do meu ensino médio, eu cursei ensino técnico em administração, integrado ao médio, no Maitec do interior de São Paulo. Eu entrei no site, eu vi que tinha um programa de bolsas. Eu me apaixonei pela escola, me apaixonei pela visão da escola. E eu vi que eu me enquadrava no perfil. Por acaso, eu acabei conhecendo o INSPER, acabei entrando no site do INSPER, fiquei completamente apaixonada pelo curso de engenharia, que tinha aquela proposta hands-on, aquela proposta mão na massa, é, uma proposta completamente disruptiva para um curso de engenharia no Brasil, e eu resolvi prestar é, o programa de bolsas. Eu descobri o INSPER, cara, eu já estava fazendo faculdade lá em Fortaleza, descobri que existia a faculdade, o INSPER, descobri o programa de bolsas, me inscrevi, passei e vim. No dia que saiu a resposta da bolsa, né, eu tava ansiosa, esperando, falei, meu Deus, o que, que vai acontecer? Liguei pra minha mãe e falei, mãe, passei, já sei qual faculdade que eu quero ir, agora não preciso escolher mais, porque eu tenho certeza que é o INSPER. Eu nunca senti algo antes como aquilo, pra mim era a concretização de todos os sonhos que aquela menina tinha. E naquele momento... Eu não sabia que a minha vida ia mudar tanto. Primeiro, a primeira coisa, se não existisse bolsa, não existia nessa no Insper, entendeu? É, não tem como, não, não fazia, estava muito longe da nossa realidade, então é, acho que poder entrar numa universidade da qualidade do Insper só, só foi possível para mim é, pela bolsa. O grande objetivo do programa de bolsas, né, do ponto de vista institucional, era trazer diversidade para o corpo discente. Na verdade, criar um corpo discente, construir um corpo discente diverso, de ideias, de propósitos, de visão de mundo. O que eu acho que é uma das grandes qualidades da população brasileira, que é a capacidade de lidar com a diversidade. E todos nós sabemos a quantidade de talentos que estão por aí, mundo afora, e que obviamente não tem oportunidade. Aliás, esse é um dos problemas do Brasil, tolerância e oportunidade. É uma realidade mesmo que a é depender do CEP onde você nasce e vai destinar seu futuro. Isso é inadmissível. Todas as pessoas que nascem no Brasil têm que ter as mesmas oportunidades para realizar seus sonhos. Não importa se elas nascem na periferia, de São Paulo, na zona rural no Nordeste, é, em bairros ricos, todos têm que ter a mesma oportunidade. A gente começou a colocar esforços onde estão esses talentos acadêmicos, porque a questão financeira, a escola estava preparada para suprir e a parte deles era trazer o gosto pelo estudo, a curiosidade intelectual, acreditar na educação como meio de geração de possibilidades para eles na vida e a gente teve o desafio então de investigar e procurar esse pessoal. Até no Ceará a gente foi parar, né? O mundo ele é muito maior do que essas oito quadras que cercam, que cercam a faculdade. E trazer gente de fora, você traz, cara, perspectivas diferentes de problemas, você traz novos problemas para dentro da faculdade. Eu acho que tem um ganho de ter diversidade dentro do corpo de alunos, que é super importante para a formação, tanto como profissionais, mas para a formação cidadã também, que eu acho que a faculdade faz parte disso. A história do ISPER é uma trajetória, as coisas vão acontecendo, é um processo. Então nós temos vários marcos. Um marco importante foi a criação das nossas bolsas não restituíveis integrais. Outro marco aí foi mais gradual, é o engajamento progressivo dos nossos ex-alunos, chamados alumni, no nosso fundo de bolsa. Nós temos um número crescente de alumni que hoje contribuem para o Fundo de Bolsas, o que nos deixa extremamente felizes e orgulhosos. Outro marco importante foi a Toca da Raposa, que foi o primeiro dormitório que nós tivemos aqui no INSPE, voltado para os bolsistas integrais. Para pessoas como eu, que são de fora de São Paulo, existe a Toca da Raposa, né, que é um residencial incrível, que foi construído pelo INSPE para abrigar esses talentos do país inteiro e conseguir viabilizar que essas pessoas estudem no INSPE. Então, é um espaço bastante colaborativo, Ativo, que me possibilita me dedicar integralmente aos estudos no INSPER. O programa de bolsa permite que essas pessoas, que esses jovens, consigam atingir seus sonhos, cursar um, um, os cursos de interesse é, numa instituição de excelência. E isso vai refletir em toda a vida desses jovens. É, do lado da instituição é muito importante porque 
Esses alunos trazem um dinamismo grande para a escola. O INSPER também é um sonho de quem acredita no Brasil. Né? Eu acho que aí todo mundo sai um pouco imbuído dessa vontade de fazer diferença, levando esse centro de supertecimento, esse olhar pragmático para onde a gente vai depois de sair aqui da, do 4A300. INSPER, na realidade, vem de inspirar e pertencer. Então esse pertencer que nós queremos realmente colocar os nossos alunos, que eles pertencem à nossa comunidade. Eles, na realidade, estão ligados à escola perenemente. A gente colocou muita energia em criar esse senso de comunidade, de engajamento, de amor à camisa, que é independentemente de qualquer contrato, é em outro lugar que está esse compromisso. Meu sonho também é poder adotar alguém como mentora, como madrinha, para o programa de bolsas e pro poder devolver ao INSPER tudo que eu recebi. Eu posso acompanhar hoje como doador, como parceiro do INSPER Iniciativas, né? ter essa troca e poder ajudar pessoas que vêm de uma realidade parecida com a minha, acho que isso para mim é, é muito legal. É um grande desafio e nós estamos aqui no INSPER dentro do nosso microcosmo, que é ensino superior, dentro daquilo que nós achamos que podemos fazer bem e adicionar valor, procurando fazer o melhor para contribuir para esse fim. E eu espero que o programa de bolsas esteja apenas começando, porque uh, é claro que todos nós aqui temos um limite, mas uh, ele de fato cria, cria enfim, impactos mais que proporcionais. É muito bom pensar no futuro do programa, né? daquilo que é, a gente colhendo os benefícios do, do que evoluiu até aqui, e o que a gente espera, o que a gente, o que a gente sonha para frente. Eu acho que hoje trabalhar com a educação é pensar que a oportunidade não pode ser só para alguns. Não pode ser para o aluno que tá, já está engajado, tem que ser para engajar um aluno também. Tem que pensar grande, tem que sonhar. Quanto mais jovens a gente forma, né? quanto é, maior a oferta né, de um programa desse para esses jovens, maior o impacto potencial para o no, no nosso país. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a, really a pleasure to have you here for this webinar. It's a joint effort by, by INSPER and IBRAC. And the theme couldn't be uh, uh, more interesting, I think. It's a very hot topic that has attracted hearts and minds. And the title expressed the, the subject, I think, very clearly. So it's big data and antitrust. And we have a fantastic group of speakers here, uh, Professors Ariel and Laura, uh, Commissioner Paula Azevedo, and also uh, many thanks for the moderators, Vinicius Klein and, and Juliano Maranhão, that were responsible for designing this, this uh, event. And um, for that reason, I, I, I will uh, leave the honor of presenting more properly the presenters to Juliano Maranhão, uh, acknowledging uh, his contribution to the design of this program. So this, this event is a collaboration between INSPER, uh, the Center for Regulation and Democracy. I had not presented myself. I'm Paulo, the head of the Center for Regulation and Democracy in, at the INSPER, and with IBRAC. And IBRAC is a very well-known entity that uh, uh, um, includes an, uh, al almost all uh, lawyers and economists that are interested in the field of uh, competition policy and regulation. So it's very important organization here in Brazil. And it's very important for the university to have this link with the external uh, uh, practitioners in this area. We learn a lot from that. So we are very proud to have this partnership. This is, I think, the, the, the third event that we have together in, the, in the, the last years. And we intend to keep this going ahead. But without... Uh, for the delay, I will pass the floor to Bruno Drago, who is the president of IBRAC. 
Bruno. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, uh, just just to uh, a small correction, I'm the, the head of the competition uh, uh, directory of, of IBRAC. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. It's a pleasure to have this partnership with INSPER. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Paulo, for, for opening the, 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 the partnership uh, or, or continuing this partnership with the BRAC. Uh, just to say this is part of, uh, the, uh, of the workshops that the BRAC is organizing uh, for this year. This is the first one. So we're honored to have this uh, team of stars to discuss such an interesting topic, uh, which related, uh, relates antitrust law. Uh, artificial intelligence, big data, data protection, uh, all those topics that sometimes uh, uh, scares us. Uh, what, is, what is ahead of us? Uh, and, and in this sense, uh, there was a, an article uh, this morning at Valor Econômico, which actually raises uh, uh, some topics for, for the debate uh, uh, today. It was an article from Jose Inácio, Vivian and Bruna, our colleagues from Ibarak. And it, it, it brings some, uh, 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 some interesting points uh, on, uh, uh, on how, do you, uh, how do you treat uh, uh, algorithms, uh, uh, eventually some uh, 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 conducts that may involve algorithms, uh, which do not uh, consider the plus factor element uh, and, and therefore do you treat that under a collusion mode or on the unilateral conduct mode. Uh, so it's, uh, it was very interesting to read it. And I, I, I think we're going to have uh, a lot of interesting thoughts, uh, views of different uh, uh, countries here, how they deal with this. And again, uh, thanks for INSPER. And Iraq is uh, always going to be close and, 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 and organize this type of events with the academy. And we intend to increase this sort of debate and bring proximity between uh, the practitioners and the academy. So thanks to you all. And I uh, shall pass the, the word to, uh, to Juliano who will conduct this, this panel. Oh, welcome to all participants. Um, so today our uh, subject matter is uh, big data and antitrust. And so being thus, uh, it's an aspect of the accumulation of uh, informational power. And uh, we are going to discuss and to debate today the uh, links and, uh, and how informational power feeds economic power and vice versa, how economic power feeds informational power. And um, we um, faced informational power in another context of the media. So in traditional media, the production of content uh, is centralized by the media companies. And so the antitrust tools for tackling with uh, economic power and informational power were aligned and uh, we didn't face too much problems. And it, they, these tools were uh, effective on um, handling economic power. But uh, in the new context of the digital media and uh, uh, the digital markets, we have uh, um, an important shift where the production of content, content is decentralized. And also um, we have uh, business models which are focused on gathering and collecting personal data and, it, and there is where the aspect of big data analytics enters to uh, process this data and generate business models and offers which are personalized uh, and which uh, affects and in, to some extent manipulate behavior of consumers. So now we have a challenge to antitrust methodology to handle this aspect of the um, of the analytics within personal data and the collection and concentration of personal data, which became the main source of informational power. The question is uh, that many um, dominant platforms, which were previously argued to be ephemeral, has proven to be persistent, precisely because of their 
ability to accumulate and concentrate power, uh, informational power of, of collecting personal data and making uh, unchallengeable business models within the context of competition. So uh, the big question uh, within this topic is whether we could sophisticate or develop antitrust techniques for, hand, for dealing with this connection between informational power and economic power, or whether we should uh, try to develop other uh, models of regulation in order to face uh, and challenge these uh, intricacies which are related to exercise of economic power together with uh, the use or exploitative use um, of personal data. And for today, for discussing this, uh, this very challenging and difficult matters, we, um, we are going to hear a talk by Ario Erzaki from the University of Oxford and director of the Center for Competition at Oxford. Uh, then we are going to uh, hear Laura Zoboli. Uh, she's professor at, of the University of Warsaw and assistant professor at the University of Bocconi. Then we are going to hear the comments by Paula Farani uh, which is uh, she's commissioner at CADI, and uh, she's going to uh, provide us a view within the Brazilian context and the Brazilian precedence at CADI regarding these challenges of handling um, um, mergers and also vertical restraints, which are related to the uh, to gathering personal data and the accumulation of personal data, and then. Uh, last but not least, Vinicius Klein is going to comment also in uh, these um, talks and the, and the debate around the Brazilian context. Vinicius Klein is professor of law and economics at the Federal University of Paraná. So uh, to begin with our discussion, I will first give the floor to Professor Ario Ezaki. Uh, Professor Ario, it's a great pleasure and honor to have you here with us. I thank you very much for your acceptance of, and of the invitation for this event today. So now, uh, please, you have the floor. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. It is uh, my pleasure to join you. Uh, let me just uh, share my slides. Okay, hopefully that you can all see the slides. Um, so I'll speak for around half an hour and what I'll try to do is to give us all some ideas of what are the key challenges, uh, what is happening. And this is really a moving target, uh, something that really makes this a fascinating area, but also sometimes challenging because um, it is literally changes um, every week in terms of the environment that we see and also the way competition agencies and regulators are addressing this. And to start, I just want to say a few words about competition dynamics. And uh, these are things that many of you will be familiar with possibly, uh, but I think it's, it's important to highlight a few things. First of all, we speak about the digital markets and we speak about big data, big analytics. No doubt we all benefit. So the starting point is is not uh, to create some sort of phobia from uh, high tech, of course not. We all understand that we're better off today. The fact that we have this event today using Zoom, being able to communicate, this is uh, a very simple illustration of all the benefits that we derive from digital economy. Um, so our discussion is not about a counterfactual, which is moving away from using the internet and emails and texting and starting uh, using pigeon post. No, that's not the counterfactual. The counterfactual is how do we treat the environment that we have today, but make sure that it continues to deliver. And to do so, we have to understand how competition dynamic in digital uh, economy differs from brick and mortar. And this is key because what we will see is that a lot of the tools that we developed over the years, uh, looking at brick and mortar, looking at traditional competition, seem to either fail to deliver when it comes to digital market or just fail to identify problems. 
So some things that are interesting, of course, are network effects. I should say that all these things, there's nothing new about them. What is new is the intensity, the aggregation of these elements and how they operate together. So we have network effects, direct network effects, indirect network effects. What they do is basically support the creation of market power. As you have valuable network effects, it is harder to leave your ecosystem, harder to leave your platform. You generate more value, you attract more users, more input providers. And this is why naturally a lot of digital markets tip in favor of a specific firm. In that market, of course, data is a critical input. And data has always played a role in competition analysis. You can find decisions that mention data, but not as a critical input that both replaces uh, monetary uh, elements and actually determines the ability to survive on the market and to compete on the market. But big data on its own is not enough. Uh, you need a combination of big data and big analytics. These are the algorithms that are used to identify patterns in the data, identify and predict if we're thinking of advanced algorithms, artificial intelligence. So we have data and algorithms, but also a characteristic of a lot of our interaction online is an asymmetry of information. Um, we as users might be very sophisticated, but at the end of the day, we have a single interaction with the interface. Whereas on the other hand, you have engineers that are able to experiment and change the interface every second, every minute in order to introduce dark patterns, in order to identify how best uh, to communicate with us, in order to identify how best to influence our behavior, our purchasing patterns. So there is a massive asymmetry. And very often we're not aware fully to the extent that data and analytics are applied to us. Because of all of these, we have seen the rise of market power, we've seen gatekeepers, and we've seen market power which is sustained. And that's important because traditionally we had an assumption that markets will self-correct and that affects your decision whether to intervene or not. Online, it is slightly less certain that markets will easily self-correct. What we have is winner takes all or most, and what we have are markets that tend to be relatively stable. And as the ecosystem expands, it becomes harder and harder to disrupt them. Um, stealth is linked to the asymmetry of information, harvesting, targeting. We'll get back to that later on. Now, one of the characteristics of our environment, of course, is the rise of platforms. And here as well, needless to say, we all benefit from platforms, from scale, from scope, from efficiencies that they deliver. But also what we have is suddenly very few players that became the bottleneck between us as users and the input providers. And we have a completely new market reality where value shifted from its traditional sources to other players. And these are the problems that we cope with. Now, the competition landscape in the past, let's say three years has been really extremely dynamic with reports and discussions of how do we deal with it. At the beginning, there were questions, there still are, but I think there is a bit more consensus these days. There were even questions of whether there is a problem. So if you go back a few years, people will tell you, well, there isn't a problem. Look how dynamic digital economy is. There's absolutely nothing that you need to do. I think we passed that. We all understand that markets are a little bit, a little bit too concentrated, that we have some serious issues with some uh, digital markets. So then the question is, are the problems that you identify a competition problem? And this is a whole area of policy discussion. It goes to the root of what is the competition law about, and different jurisdictions will have different ideas of what competition law is targeting. Easy example, EU will deal more with fairness. We will care about the distribution of wealth. US, you will deal less with fairness, although in theory, the FTC Act, you have reference to fairness, but this is not something that has ever been taking on effectively. And you are less concerned with distribution of wealth. Uh, You're more concerned with consumer welfare in general. Even if you believe that competition law should be applied, then there is the question of intervention. 
are you over interventing are you under interventing is the market likely to self correct are you chilling competition by intervening so these are elements that really come into play and here again um as the number of lawyers and economists that you'll have in a room this will be the number of opinions uh, that you will have on whether a given market might self correct uh, or not fair enough this is not accurate science anyone in this talk that has uh, enough mileage in competition law and economics understands that okay so then the question becomes if there is a problem if we believe that the market will not easily self correct what is it that we're doing to what extent should we intervene what are the tools that we should apply if the law does not capture a certain activity should we amend the law so should we say that illegality is determined by the law as it was designed and applied in past years or should we say that illegality should be determined by the risk and harm that we are facing and therefore we might need to amend the law these are two different perspectives that would completely affect your appetite for intervention and if you amend the law what exactly should you do should you shift the standard of proof should you lower the threshold to prove violation what is the risk on legal certainty on business certainty and let's say that you intervene our experience has been the remedies are not that effective they do not really restore competition uh, a good example in europe is the google case by the time the, it's still litigated uh, now in court but they but they time the commission released its decision you know i mean it was dead on arrival in terms of the market now it still had a valuable impact the remedy may have uh, instilled some change but it certainly did not restore competition on the market which led us to a more recent debate that we have injecting more ex ante tools preempt the problem either from within competition law for example market investigations or from outside competition law with the introduction of regulation that is specific to digital markets or to the wider areas of data protection privacy so these are all the the, the not all but these are the key policy questions that we have and to be honest um if you were now to start reading all the reports it will take you months because there are just so many reports on this all very valuable all very interesting the nice thing is that after a while we all started to reach a certain consensus so in policy circles we're starting to speak relatively uh, similar language and that is really crucial because if you go back even 2 years uh, there was a real difference in in um in the approach to digital markets i think there is now a certain consensus which lead us to what i will spend the rest of my talk to some of the problems and some of the interesting problems i want to start with collusion i'll then speak about discrimination and then mention a little bit platforms and ecosystems um, to give us uh, all an idea so um in terms of collusion this is an interesting area because it just highlights how algorithms change the dynamics of competition in ways that we may not have taken into account in the past the classic and easiest example would be when you have collusion between individuals between humans between companies and the collusion is facilitated by using algorithms and here we have a few examples all of them are simple from a legal perspective that's a no brainer there is no issue here because the law that applies to cartel will apply of course to cartels that are facilitated using algorithms just as it would apply to a cartel that is facilitated by using emails and texts nothing special here except for the fact that if i automate my policing mechanism and my reaction mechanism in a cartel just by doing it i'm stabilizing the cartel so if you know that i have a way to detect breaches of the cartel agreement because we are using automated systems it reduces your incentive to cheat on the cartel so we create a more stable environment and that has a significance in terms of the cartel it has another significance that we will have less communications between cartel members if we have automation which makes it more challenging for competition agencies to capture these interactions i know now in the us there is um a little bit of discussion about real estate uh, markets there are lots of markets where you have these subtle cartels 
are these cartels? Are these just communications? The key challenge here from a legal perspective is the dividing line between harmless signals that go below the intervention and signals that you would consider to be significant enough. The next one is, is more interesting and, and a bit more challenging. Hub and spoke cartels is something that we're all familiar with, vertical link that creates a horizontal collusion. So one seller will communicate to its supplier, its intentions, the supplier will communicate it to a different seller and we have a cartel. The interesting thing in an automated system is that we can have an incidental hub and spoke cartel. Online, if I have a website, I will not set the prices on a daily basis. What I'll do is I'll often engage in dynamic pricing. Amazon has the capacity in-house. Many large companies will have it in-house, but many sellers that have smaller website don't have this in-house. They outsource to a third party, a company that provides them with pricing strategy. What happens when I, let's say I have an online shop for uh, here in Oxford for um, office equipment. I outsource the pricing to that company. That company, the algorithm, looks at the market, demand and supply, and based on that determines what is the optimal price. But what happens if another office supplier in Oxford uses the same company and another one and another one? What you will have is an incidental hub and spoke. The algorithm that previously had to look outside at the market and determine with all the uncertainty my strategy suddenly manages the whole market on the server. So you just eliminated the uncertainty from that story. And this is not a fictional proposition. You have those structures already in several markets. A nice example that we give um, is A2I Systems, um, a company that, for example, manages the petrol prices in Rotterdam. First petrol station joined them. Second, at the moment, all petrol or almost all petrol stations in Rotterdam are serviced by a single server. So the algorithm on that server actually does not face the uncertainty of the market, quite the opposite, it controls the market. Now, at what point is that illegal? The first person, the second person, at what point do we object to that? Interestingly, those companies on their websites, you will see that there is a promise that they will reduce the likelihood of price war. This has yet to be challenged by competition agencies. I think there is a really interesting question here, whether these type of things that are very much in the gray zone should be something that we look at or not. Last story of collusion, which is probably the most interesting but less relevant today, is the story of tacit collusion. Uh, I assume we're all familiar with conscious parallelism, with the fact that when humans engage in conscious parallelism, this is not in itself anti, it might be anti-competitive, but it's not illegal because it is a rational reaction to market characteristics. You increase the price, I realize that for me, it is rational to follow your price increase, I increase the price as well. What happens when we turn that from a human behavior, rational profit maximization in oligopolistic market, into an automated system. So once we automate that, what might happen is that I can create much more stability and I can create instances of conscious parallelism in markets that have more participants. So markets that would previously be too complicated for humans unilaterally to sustain this equilibrium might become stable. So one level is to ask whether when we create algorithms for that purpose, this in itself is something that we should condemn. And the second level is to appreciate that once you automate the whole process and you just use artificial intelligence, would computers find the logic and realize that it makes more sense to reach the equilibrium above competitive levels on their own? In other words, is it the case that in the future, when we have more markets that are automated, the natural tendency will be to see higher prices, such as the ones that you will tend to find in markets with tacit collusion. Very nice work done by uh, Calavano and his associates uh, on Q-learning, which is a simple form of AI. You see here um, a diagram taken from their study. What you see, the two lines, the blue and the red ones, are two algorithms, Q-learning, so AIs, 
they were basically not taught anything. They were basically thrown into an environment with pricing and they had to identify what is the right price. Lower line is the competitive price. After a while, the algorithms reach the top line. What you see the shock next to zero is when in the experiment, one of the algorithm was forced down. So basically it was forced to cheat on the tacit agreement. And what you see is that the other algorithm react immediately, automatically, and the two algorithms then go back to the equilibrium. Very interesting. What it tells you is that AI, when the market conditions are uh, adequate, could in the future find it to be rational and possible to reach tacit collusion on its own. That is a simple example uh, in their experiments. Later uh, experiments, they had it with more price levels with more participants. So they try to complicate it and bring it closer to market. This is not something that you would expect to see these days, but I think it is a very interesting um, insight to what we might expect in the future as we move more and more of our livelihood and markets online. The second story that I want to tell you, that was the story. The first one was the story of collusion. The second story that I would like to tell you is the story of discrimination and personalization. Um, and here is the fact, this is based on work that we've done, uh, Maurice Stucky and I, and we cover in our book, Virtual Competition, in several articles. It is basically just to appreciate that whereas most of us still have the impression that when you go online, what you see is a reflection of the market, is to appreciate that what you have is often a distorted view of the market that was created for you, for your purposes. So to appreciate that what we have is an industry where A, a lot of our data is being harvested, B, it is being analyzed, and C, based on these analytics, what you have is then a personalized universe that is created for you. And in that personal universe, you might have all the options that someone else has, but they will be ordered differently. There will be more friction that is presented in one end and less friction in the other end. And what will happen is that you will see a reality that might look as a reflection of the competitive landscape, but will not. I often tell people that it is like um, walking on a path thinking, you know, with a real sense of autonomy and not realizing that someone else created that path for you and is leading you directly into or towards a certain goal. So what you see is, and, and many of you probably already experienced this online, you go online uh, after a while because of your search history, what will happen, the prices you will get will tend to be personalized to you. They will not be the result of dynamic pricing, it will be the result of personalized pricing. In other words, the algorithm tries to assess what is your willingness to pay, what is your reservation price, and target you there. And by doing that, it can basically engage in discriminatory pricing. There is, of course, a question whether this is um, an anti-competitive activity or whether this should be a consumer protection problem. Either way, we are living in a slightly different reality now where you can be targeted. So um, if you go online to a company that provides services of personalized pricing, I'll give you an example. The simplest personalized pricing algorithm will basically check what was the path that the user used to reach your website. If I reached your website through Google or Bing or another search engine, you will likely give me the competitive price because the algorithm assumes that I'm aware of outside options. On the other hand, if I'm a loyal customer and I clicked and reached your website directly, I am rewarded by being charged more. Basically, loyalty is being punished. Now, how do you then deal with that? Because of course, there is a reputation issue here. Very easily, it's all about framing. It is not that you are charged more, it is just that the other party is getting a discount. So what happens is that there is a lot of framing that is happening, just as when you go on a flight and the person next to you paid less and you appreciate, maybe they booked it at a different time. We all got used to the fact that some other people may have gotten a deal. So it is framed as giving discount to some people and not to others rather than charging more from the loyal customers. And there are plenty of, of examples that you will find. 
the, just to give you an insight to the power that is involved in this, um, these days, it's not just about pricing discrimination, it's about behavioral discrimination. It is about the ability to classify us based on our texts, on the messages that you write online, on the websites that you visit, the time that you spend, how you behave with your mouse on the screen. And all of these are monitored and you can be classified. For example, Facebook uh, in one study divided people to different categories. Are you in the category of anxious, stress, overwhelmed, stupid? And you can be serviced either with news stories or advertisements based on your vulnerability. A real change in the market, in the reality that we have. When you go on the high street, no one knows who you are. You still benefit from this anonymity, which means that you benefit from the market price. When you go online, you're exposed, you're completely exposed. And that's a real difference in the dynamic. At the moment, this is not a competition problem or treated as a competition problem in many uh, jurisdictions. The big question for us is whether this is something that we need to look at because it certainly is a change in dynamics. Okay, I want now to speak a little bit about platforms and this is uh, both from virtual competition but also from uh, Maurice and my book uh, on uh, competition overdose. That's the cover, back to covering the cover. Um, so I think the story here is possibly just to understand the rise of the game makers. So we're all familiar with platforms. What is important to appreciate is that all of us, for example, just as an illustration, are hooked on one of two operating systems when it comes to mobile. You either have the Apple operating system or Android. Very few of you will have an alternative. Already that gives you an idea what happened on the market. Our markets basically became more and more concentrated and we have very few gatekeepers and each one of them operates not just a platform but an ecosystem. So where we find ourselves is that we are operating in a whole universe which is controlled. And this affects us, it affects the service providers. Those entities that control uh, either the ecosystems or at a smaller scale, those who have platforms and operate platforms basically are like small autonomies or large autonomies. They determine the price that you need to pay. They determine the nature of competition on the platform, the dynamics of competition, the level of transparency. They determine the tax that sellers have to pay in order to reach you. They determine the advertising. They determine the flow of information and money. So in competition overdose, for instance, we look at how, if you think of the advertising ecosystem online, on how for every pound that you put at the top as an advertiser, very little get actually to the publisher, to the website at the bottom. Most of it disappears within the ecosystem. So the ecosystems that we have, you shouldn't think of them as neutral platforms that combines sellers and customers or service providers and customers. The ecosystems design the whole framework to benefit the game maker, the controller of the ecosystem. So we, again, we moved from markets that if you imagine the high street, a free market into a market that is controlled, like a shopping mall that controlled all the parameters of competition like a market where there is taxation, there are fees, someone determines what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And indeed, we have quite a lot of cases at the moment that deal with platforms and ecosystems, either from sellers that complain about being exploited or excluded, or sellers that complain that they are being abused because they have to pay too much tax to reach us, and users that complain that they are being exploited because too much data is being harvested from them for the right to be on, on the platform. So that is probably, and, and these are the stories that are in the headlines when you think about enforcement actions in the US, of course, the FTC and Department of Justice with their 
uh, more recent focus on um, Google, on Facebook, on Amazon in the EU, uh, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Google. Uh, this is now probably the main driver of the debate, the story of market power. It's a story that it e that is slightly easier to understand because it deals with things that look a little bit like exclusionary practices, but of course, with a lot of differences. The currency that we deal with is data. The mechanisms are about automated analytics, and it is about everything that happens on these ecosystems and how we can actually cope with these uh, changes. Um, very briefly, one of the interesting, most interesting areas in, in this story is the story of innovation. Because if you think of the engine that drives future markets, it is innovation. And here, um, I think it's just important to highlight the driving mechanism. There is innovation, there is lots of innovation at platform level, at ecosystem level, and of course you have a lot of innovative terms. But it's important to distinguish between the value chain that characterizes the platform and the ecosystem and disruptive innovation outside the value chain. When you see innovation online, on Facebook, on Google, on whatever platform you're using, whatever innovation you'll see will always be within the value chain of the game maker. Anything outside that value chain is disruptive because it risks the profit-making mechanism. Those are what we refer to as the pirates. Those are the innovative pirates. And the problem that we have is that even when you hear that there is a lot of innovation, and actually there is a drop in investment in research and development, but that's a different story. That's an empirical story that we can debate uh, later on. But even when you hear about investment, you have to appreciate that a lot of that investment takes place within the value chain. And any new development outside that value chain is being crushed. So whereas we see innovation, that innovation in the future will be relatively concentrated and will not necessarily benefit us as customers. So we don't have a plurality of innovation. And there are lots of mechanism levers that are used by the platforms to ensure that whatever innovation you receive is innovation that service them. And that will include affecting our demand for innovation, manipulating the supply for innovation, affecting the innovation paths outside the ecosystems by funding. Of course, we are all familiar with killer acquisitions. And really what happens there is that because of all of that, you have increased market power, you have less competition on innovation, and then we start to see harmful innovation. We start to see innovation efforts that don't necessarily support us. They benefit the ecosystem rather than benefiting us. So this is, this is an area that Maurice and I uh, worked on uh, for the European Commission uh, uh, and prepared a report for them. We're actually, this is now the area of research that we focus on uh, ahead of us uh, publishing a book on that. And we think this is probably it's going to be one of the keys for our future prosperity to just understand what are the engines uh, for innovation. What do we do about it in, in, in 30 seconds? In Europe, we're trying to push on three um, levels, trying to make enforcement more effective. Interesting here is the interim measure and, being, and having more effective remedies. At the same time, we have proposals to have ex-ante interventions something very similar to the market investigation tool that we already have here in the UK. The European Commission put a proposal for a competition tool. The idea is you are not investigating a specific company, you're investigating the market as a whole and trying to make the market more competitive. It is quite a radical tool in many ways because you can have structural and behavioral remedies, but it could hold the key to a lot of the future prosperity. It can unlock markets that are concentrated and of course, we have now uh, really a lot of serious discussion on regulatory instrument. We have the Digital Market Act, the Digital Services Act. We have regulation that deals with data, that deals with online privacy. And I think there is an emerging 
realization that you will have to have regulation alongside the competition instruments. It's not enough to be reactive. You need to be proactive. Very similar in the UK, just for those of you who are interested, the, regu the regulatory regime in the, in the UK will be slightly different. The proposal, we look at strategic market status, and that's quite interesting. It will be a more tailor-made proposal where you will create regulation per game maker. And that's quite interesting. It is a, born, a more nuanced, rather than to try and have um, a fix-it-all medicine, it is something that, you know, like the old pharmacies that you created, you, you, you mix the medicine per, uh, uh, per patient. And in the U.S., of course, um, you know, U.S. is undergoing a massive massive change. I mean, we know Lena, uh, Lena Khan uh, was just announced as, as, as the new head, that she's going to be the, the new head of the FTC. This is a, a, a continuation of the signal of a change in enforcement. We have FTC, uh, Department of Justice, now being extremely active. The US uh, Congress, uh, the House Judiciary Committee, released um, a report that is, is truly revolutionary in US terms. Uh, and in many ways, the, the rhetoric now in the US is more interventionist than the rhetoric in Europe. A massive, massive change. Uh, will be very interesting to see what happens in the US. There's gonna be a little bit of a clash between the courts that are still um, affected by the old jurisprudence and maybe very reserved in their approach and what the FTC and Department of Justice will try to do. And possibly because of that, we will see an attempt to um, bypass the courts uh, using regulatory instruments. So it's gonna be quite interesting to see how the US is, is approaching that. I'll drop the international dimension. If anyone has a question later on, we can discuss a little bit about free riding and, and exclusions. And I'll just conclude by saying that uh, how competitive the online environment is, much less than we should uh, hope for. It is competitive. We're all benefiting. No one wants to go back to an era where you booked your airline ticket in a kiosk in your neighborhood or bought your laptop or PC from someone, uh, the single seller in the city. I mean, we're better off the way we are. But is it as competitive as we like to think? No. Is the invisible hand really determining the dynamics? No, what we have is a digitalized hand. And you have to remember that because although it might look the same, the difference is, is that a company or an executive can decide one morning to change the dynamic of competition and decide that it will not resemble the market, but resemble something else. Just an example, not that it really happens. Think of Uber. Prices are determined by an algorithms. They should reflect the market, the traffic with the weather. I can decide tomorrow morning, it's sunny, I can decide to increase the price because of something. I can decide to change um, the supply in one neighborhood. So we're really moving into a managed economy where very few entities have the power to influence the variables of competition. And of course, this is not a call for um, uh, intervention regardless of the facts. So always remember, we have to be mindful of the risk of over and under intervention. Arguably, at the moment, we're still under intervening. Um, there is a clear impact on markets. There's also a clear impact on the market for ideas and democracy. You only have to look at the US and uh, what happened there in terms of the last two elections to appreciate how what we're talking on here on markets doesn't stop with our pockets. It really goes um, all the way to our livelihood. I'll end with that and I'll be happy to uh, hear your comments and also answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ariel, for this very insightful talk. And um, I would like to remember the audience that uh, you may uh, write our questions at the YouTube and we are going to select questions to pose to the uh, speakers today. Um, I asked uh, Paulo if uh, there were any questions for the audience already. Uh, not yet. Okay. I do have some questions, but I, I think it's better to, to yeah, wait so for I. Laura's presentation and then have yeah. a debate and also comments by Commissioner Paula Farani. Uh, 
Yeah, so do I. So let us leave the questions after the our speakers have uh, talked. And uh, but uh, the audience can already pose their questions by writing at at YouTube. So uh, now I would like to give the floor to Laura's presentation. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for this excellent opportunity to discuss uh, those uh, extremely interesting issues. And as, as Professor Ezraki mentioned, we are really dealing with a moving target. And my idea is to uh, start from uh, his perspective, which is indeed um, if and how competition law should intervene, or in other words, uh, are we discussing competition problems? And so my key question is what, let's call it traditional antitrust, um, might not be able to tackle or even what traditional antitrust shouldn't tackle. Because of course, I mean, uh, the role of regulation uh, is, is relevant and is driven by different factors and so on. Uh, so the, let's say, hype about competition law applied to digital markets uh, depend from uh, different and several uh, categories and uh, Professor Ezraki uh, framed uh, all of them uh, for us and, and gave us a, a very uh, interesting overview on them. So I decided for my presentation just to focus on three uh, specific uh, topics and issues, um, starting from uh, what, uh, let's say, taking advantage of various presentations, so I will for sure not go through all the forms of collusion, and I will start from his comments that we can consider algorithmic collusion as a very interesting phenomenon, uh, even though when it comes to competition law, uh, somehow we can agree that its role uh, is limited. What I want to discuss when it comes to algorithmic collusion is to consider the more extreme scenario uh, in which um, two or more companies collude in the digital markets uh, without having given any kind of information or instruction to their algorithm and in the context in which uh, there is no intent. So this is the first of the three topics I would like to address. The second one is indeed linked to the uh, very last part of Arjun's presentation concerning antitrust enforcement strategies, uh, the approach of the US and the most recent initiatives at the uh, national levels. And last but not least, I would like to quickly frame the category of self-preferencing. Uh, somebody could reply, it's not a distinct category, but this is something I will discuss as my third and last point. So in the next around 20 minutes, I will address these three uh, points. So when it comes to algorithmic collusion, as I was mentioning, um, my idea is to focus on few specific aspects. So we're in front of a scenario in which two or more companies operating in the digital uh, markets happen to collude. Uh, and let's imagine that they go in the direction of colluding establishing uh, interdependent prices. So exactly the example that Ariel was making. Uh, so the first point, uh, quite a basic one, is can we consider there is a meeting of minds? So can we consider that we are in front of an agreement? And here, um, interesting enough, uh, there are not many, many scholars or enforcers that goes in the direction of considering the opportunity of a strict liability. So there is the idea that some intent should be uh, proven. And of course, we can uh, discuss um, how far, um, let's say, the orders, the, the orders of those algorithms should check and control the actions put in place by their own algorithms. So when it comes to, uh, let's say, uh, the definition of agreement, of an agreement, we should uh, try to understand uh, how far this definition can be broadened in order to include those cases in which uh, players operating in the digital markets kind of lose control of their uh, algorithms. So in this context, there is a debate concerning the opportunity of understanding um, if uh, we can identify some sort of intent or subjective element. So the 
fact that a company is colluding in the digital markets via algorithm, how far this company should be asked to control its own algorithm. And I think we all remember the quite strong statement by Margarete Vestager concerning the fact that you are liable of what your algorithms are doing in the digital markets. Um, this is just to stress the fact that even though we can easily agree that uh, strict liability is not the solution, so we shouldn't condemn, uh, let's say, uh, price um, interdependent conduct per se. Uh, otherwise, we can agree that when it comes to the algorithm uh, collusion, some sort of uh, additional thought should be given to the subject element. And in this sense, I want to uh, move, uh, let's say, my comments in the direction of the liability of the players. What do I mean is, at the end of the day, we are imagining a scenario in which uh, the company operating online, operating in the digital market, uh, didn't uh, provide the algorithm with any kind of order. So the algorithm is colluding, let's say, or better, is coordinating when it comes to prices with competitors' algorithms without any kind of instruction uh, from uh, the order. So let's imagine the same scenario offline outside the, the digital markets. I think we all agree that outside uh, the digital markets, we cannot find the companies liable. So as far as there is no meeting of minds, there is no meeting of minds, so there is no agreement, and so there is no anti-competitive conduct. And of course, this is an approach that we can keep in the digital market. So traditional, let's say, antitrust wouldn't, uh, let's say, punish such conduct. However, if we check the literature, we can find several and different solution offers. So somebody can go toward the most traditional position, there is lack of liability. Why? Because there is no agreement in the sense of meeting of minds. So the, let's say, colluders haven't coordinated and therefore there is no an infringement of competition law. The contrary, even though I consider that is an enormous shift of paradigm and I think it's very difficult to, let's say, second this perspective, could be some sort of strict liability. Once you start to operate online, you have to control your algorithm. If at the end of the day, there is a proper collusion, so not just a strategic idea of checking the prices of competitors so we can demonstrate that there is some sort of collusion, then you should be as liable. But other solutions that, in my opinion, are more interesting and should be discussion, uh, the center of the discussion maybe of next uh, policy moves at the European Union level, could be uh, models like antitrust by design. What do I mean? Is that um, somehow um, it could happen that um, the uh, companies should indeed design their algorithms in a way that uh, those algorithms cannot truly go outside their control when it comes to fixing some prices. And I found in the literature also another proposal in the sense of asking players to double check their functioning of the algorithms before pricing. I'm not um, seconding any of these positions. I'm just stressing the fact that even though uh, traditional antitrust wouldn't consider that algorithm collusion should be pursued as far as there is no meeting of minds, however, I think it's important to recognize that there is a vibrant debate on gray and different forms of liabilities that indeed should be uh, considered any time we discuss about competition law in the digital markets dimension. So the second uh, point uh, of uh, the many points that uh, Professor Ezraki discussed that uh, I would like to share a few words on is indeed um, the uh, matter of antitrust enforcement and specifically the enforcement toward uh, dominant players and most likely uh, toward those platforms that, as uh, borrowing from Professor Ezraki uh, presentation, can be defined as ecosystems. So those platforms, uh, which indeed uh, offer um, services and making them a, a real uh, ecosystem. So um, discussing the enforcement of antitrust law toward, let's say, dominant companies, I think it is very interesting to start with a comparison between the US system, the US scenario, uh, the European Union scenario, and uh, further scenarios. 
Uh, if it is true that recently uh, the U.S. enforcers increase their intervention, so uh, we can easily agree that the big accusation toward U.S. enforcers in the sense of lack of enforcement has been, let's say, reduced recently thanks to the change in policy priorities and so on. And of course, we can expect that in the short future, uh, we will have even a stronger interventionism. Um, however, the comment I would like to make here is, what is, uh, at the end of the day, the content of these claims? So what is uh, the range of conducts that US authorities are pursuing? Is there something new under the sun? Or we're just discussing about a policy choice of being, let's say, more active in terms of enforcement. And I think this is interesting also in comparison to the European uh, conduct, the European uh, strategy that, as Professor Ezraki was mentioning, uh, is uh, making regulation as a tool that is indeed acting together with competition law. So the enforcement strategy in the US is um, clearly going in the direction of an increase of the enforcement. But if we check the several claims started, for example, to where Google, Facebook, or even the case uh, plaintiff versus Google and Apple at the same time uh, concerning indeed uh, a discursivity agreement that those players were putting in place, my impression is that the conducts that are under investigation are, uh, let's say, traditional conducts. So these are conducts that were um, condemned by uh, traditional, let's say, antitrust. So they are conducts which can, we can reconduct to uh, exclusivity agreements or to tying agreements or even to manipulation of interoperability, com compatibility, and so on. All these conducts were condemned at the European Union level by Article 102 of the Treaty of the Function of the European Union, and the same conducts were, of course, condemned also in the US. Why I'm stressing this? Because a point that I consider crucial is um, linked to the comment that Ariel made, should we amend the law? So right now, of course, the US and, uh, antitrust enforcer increased the level of intervention. And we can consider that this is justified by a policy, or even we can push the reasoning to consider that there is some geopolitical interest and so on in increasing the intervention. But once we check all these claims, in my opinion, we are discussing, let's say, traditional conducts carried out by players operating in the digital markets, mainly platforms that put in place their own ecosystems and that at the end of the day are uh, putting in place traditional anti-competitive conducts. Um, so can we uh, consider that uh, all the interventions in terms of both antitrust enforcement and um, let's say ex ante regulation is kind of changing this scenario or the scenario is exactly the same, it's just a matter of priorities. It's just a matter of, um, let's say, policy and strategy of the single uh, antitrust enforcers. And um, this pushed me to the third point of my presentation, which is indeed uh, a conduct that we can consider more original. Why more original? Uh, because it is a conduct which is strictly linked to the idea of platforms which are acting as ecosystems. Uh, indeed, in the case of self-preferencing, which um, is indeed uh, at the center of the contemporary competition law discussion, uh, we um, imagine um, a scenario in which um, um, a company might be consider as abusing its dominant position depending on the effects that its conduct is producing on the market. In other words, any time um, a company is abusing its dominant position, let's say favoring its own products or services instead of those of competitors, 
then we can discuss about self-preferencing. The most common example is, of course, the Google shopping decision, where the European Commission had uh, Google uh, liable for, let's say, positioning and displaying its own products more favorably in uh, the Google uh, shopping um, uh, tool. Uh, so the point is that self-pressuring conducts can overlap with several and different conducts falling within the scope of the Article 102 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So we can find self-preferencing include, including tying. We can find self-preference conduct including bundling. We can find discriminatory conducts. Uh, we can find exclusive agreement that in the end uh, provoke self-preferencing and so on. So what I want to stress is that the debate is indeed in direction of understanding if and how self-preference should be made a separate and different uh, category, a separate and different conduct to be pursued. So should we amend competition law in the sense that self-preferencing is a separate conduct or should we consider that competition law as it is already address self-referencing, also considering that self-preference can express itself in several different ways that indeed represent conducts uh, falling within the dimension of a possible abuse of dominance. And of course, against this background, um, the use of a self-preference category uh, can address uh, some of the concerns um, that we are listening on a daily basis concerning the risk of a growing power of gatekeeper platforms, the risk of a uh, growing power of ecosystems uh, made in place by those gatekeeper platforms and so on. And in this context, I think it's extremely relevant to think about a double uh, scenario. So what do I mean is that, of course, competition law should remain an exposed tool that intervene any time there is a possible abuse of dominance. So in the example I made before, uh, we can consider that competition law should intervene any time self-preferencing expresses itself through conducts which indeed represent entail an abuse of dominant position. So there is no doubt that in this specific case, competition law should intervene. So what about the possibility of discussing self-preferences as a separate category? And in this, uh, let's say, um, last uh, perspective, I think we should think about uh, the old initiative, uh, the regulatory initiative that we recently witnessed at the EU level and at the national level. Um, in this uh, context, um, I uh, think that the DMA is, of course, the piece of regulation we should discuss. But in doing so, I want to start by a quite um, strong uh, comment in the sense that in my no, there is not my opinion, but of course, we should always remember that the DMA is justified by internal market goals. So the DMA uh, finds its roots in the Article 114 of the Treaty Functioning of the European Union. So is the, the ju judicial basis of the DMA is the internal market goal. It's not the implementation of Article 101 and 102 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. So since I expressed myself in a quite confused way, what I want to stress here is that the DMA is justifiable in light of the internal market goal. So that's the reason why we can consider that the DMA establishes as a priority pursuing some self-referencing conduct justified by the need of fostering the internal market, but is not a matter of competition law strict to say so. So in this sense, uh, we can agree that the DMA, uh, that of course is still a proposal, so we will see how the final test will address the self-preference phenomenon. However, we can agree that the DMA is indeed putting on gatekeeper platforms, so any time a platform can be defined as a gatekeeper, then it has to, um, let's say, comply with the DMA. And as we know, the DMA includes a list of conducts that are in the forms of obligations and prohibitions. So those gatekeeper platforms 
cannot do several conducts, cannot carry out several conducts, and have to carry out other conducts. And among those, we can find some expression of self-preferencing. For example, a gatekeeper platform cannot favor its own products and services um, on its own platform uh, instead of those offered by the competitors in the same platform. So, of course, the DMA is approaching the self-preference phenomenon with a tool that is of, uh, a tool of example regulation and is uh, putting on the gatekeepers prohibitions of self-preferencing of their uh, products and services. While we can also think about different approaches, which indeed uh, still goes in the direction of, let's say, reducing uh, the uh, action of gatekeeper platforms uh, in any um, action that can be reconducted to self-preferencing. So, in this context, we can consider that the models, the different models of a regulation or proposal for regulation adopted uh, within Europe differ in the sense that, for example, the DMA is not offering the players the possibility of demonstrating an increase of efficiency. So there is no way for a gatekeeper platform, once a platform falls within the definition of gatekeeper in light of the DMA, then there is no possibility of justifying a self-preferencing conduct in the sense of favoring its own services and products within the platform itself. While there are different models, as the one um, elaborated at the German level, for example, which are allowing some sort of efficiency defense. So the possibility of, let's say, um, demonstrate that there is an increase in efficiency. And in this sense, we can consider that, for example, the German model establishes that um, those companies holding power across markets using the definition of the German uh, law, the German Competition Law Act, still have to prove the efficiency. So there is an um, increase in uh, and uh, a burden of proof on them, but they can demonstrate that in this specific factual scenario, there is an increase of efficiency and thus their conduct is objectively justified. And Another approach is the one um, I will uh, address very quickly because Ariel already mentioned that the CMA uh, proposal is in the sense of uh, that we cannot second a one-size-fits-all model. So the idea is that on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, the CMA will go in the direction of codes of conduct with those companies which indeed um, can be compared by uh, which the uh, DMA uh, gatekeepers, so those um, companies which have a strategic um, market status. In this specific case, the CMA is offering uh, a model which is uh, less, let's say, fixed and which somehow can provide um, companies which more uh, a possibility to negotiate in the sense of codes of conduct. And also uh, the Italian proposal, which is, of course, still in the form of a proposal, so it has not been approved yet, seems to move in the direction of a model which is uh, similar to the uh, German one. Indeed, there is this idea of allowing, uh, let's say, companies uh, with a strategic uh, power in the digital markets to uh, demonstrate there is a, that there is an increase in the efficiency and that their specific conducts are justified. So just to uh, connect my three points and let's say make a quick uh, overview of my uh, impressions in light of the very exhaustive uh, presentation that Professor Zraki made, I think the key question here is uh, indeed uh, how far competition law should go and how far uh, regulation should go in the context of platform economy, 
and in the context of digital market. And this is linked, of course, to a second question, which is, should we modify the tools in the hands of competition authorities? Should we modify the conducts that fall within the scope of competition law? And moreover, is how far regulation should go once we discuss uh, the functioning of the digital markets. And my impression is that if we check the current scenario, starting from collusion, moving to enforcement toward uh, potential abuse of dominance, and checking new forms of expression of those uh, abusive conducts in the digital market, we can consider that when it comes to competition law, competition law is still addressing them ex post, of course, and I cannot see also in the uh, increase of enforcement at the EU and the US level, a true difference when it comes to the content. So the conducts that are pursued are always the same. While if we check the role of regulation, starting from the DMA, of course, which is um, the most controversial uh, proposal on the table, we can consider that regulation is pushing in the direction of establishing more strict boundaries in decreasing, let's say, the possibility uh, for companies to let defend themselves to efficiency uh, in light of efficiency defenses and so on. So that's just to say that, in my opinion, competition law has not changed its paradigm, its paradigm at all and shouldn't change its paradigm at all. Well, of course, we can easily agree that regulation is increasing its role when it comes to competitive dynamics within uh, digital uh, markets broadly speaking, and uh, toward uh, platform uh, specifically. So I think I will uh, stop myself here to leave space to the comments and the debate. And thank you very much for uh, your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for your very interesting, insightful co uh, comments and considerations. Um, we have uh, some questions already from the audience. So I think it's uh, wise to uh, make a, a very quick round of questions before we move for our commentators. Um, so, uh, uh, Paulo, would you like to introduce first questions? Yes, actually, we have a, a very interesting questions here. Uh, three of them are related, so I will uh, try to... Uh, assembled then in a single question. One is by Rafael Zanata. It's about the collaboration between antitrust authorities and da data protection authorities. And Maxwell Menezes is, is asking about the cooperation between uh, uh, authorities uh, uh, between or among different countries, so international collaboration among a, a, a competition authorities. So both are talking about this challenge that competition authorities and other enforcers they have to implement these uh, uh, new uh, tools and, and identifying the role of collaboration there. What I, I add one of myself, so we, we, we have this, uh, we have a lot of talk about uh, uh, over or under intervention, so the more the general perception of uh, under intervention but not so much talk about uh, the quality of the intervention and i think today both ariel and laura they they advance it in, in in this discussion and both of them they talked about the need or uh, some leeway for regulation and or the this preemptive approach to increase competitiveness and and if we take the status quo of uh, most jurisdictions, they have a well-established competition authority only. And so the question is how to implement this preemptive approach to increase competitiveness? Should we increase the scope of the competition authority? Should we create a regulatory uh, agency like a uh, data protection, for, for instance? How is the proper design of this uh, uh, in order to enforce these new measures? So, and then the, the, the idea of collaboration between the two agencies or 
uh, uh, international co collaboration among jurisdictions come into play as well? So this is the, the question for both of them. Uh, Laura, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? I'm, I don't know. As you prefer. Um, I'm happy either way. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, um, please go ahead. Yeah, Laura, please, uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to start. Uh, okay. I mean, this way, this way because, you, because you follow me in the presentation, this way yeah, you can yeah. say whatever you have yeah. on your mind and I'll, <laughs> I'll work around this. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So um, just to start from the end and then going back to the, to the starting question. So when it comes to uh, should we create an ad hoc authority, and of course this is linked to all the other comments uh, made, I think we can see that there are alternative models uh, and the CMA, as uh, it was mentioned, indeed uh, moving in the direction of uh, appointing an ad hoc unit for digital markets. So the idea is we need a separate authority addressing antitrust concerns in the digital markets. So that may be uh, the final uh, enforcement strategy will be more successful, while the DMA went in the direction of a centralization of power in the ends of the commission. And uh, the result will be that when it comes to cooperation among authorities, we will have still the commission at the center. And then, of course, the member state competition authorities will cooperate through ACN and so on. So the two models are uh, alternative. Um, in my uh, impression is uh, that um, we don't really need uh, a separate authority per se. So it's not a need that I consider as impellent. However, I think the model of the UK in the sense of uh, creating this dialogue among players and this unit and making it uh, uh, factual based and case by case based uh, could be uh, really successful. And this is linked to um, the question on the cooperation among authorities. Um, I see that there is, of course, um, the idea of increasing the cooperation among national authorities in the European Union, uh, while when it comes to the international level, um, I will maybe leave this to Ariel that also had a slide on the international uh, scenario, uh, because in my impression is that uh, we can find similarity in the change of the enforcement strategy in the US and the EU, but there is no uh, strict connection in the uh, rationale beyond this increase in the intervention. And the last comment I would like to ma make was concerning this uh, quality of the intervention that Paolo, pa Paolo was uh, raising, uh, that, um, of course, uh, when it comes to the quality of the intervention, uh, we can uh, consider that um, it really depends from what you're looking for, because um, I think, as I was mentioning at the end of my presentation, that uh, the increase in the enforcement is still uh, justifiable in light of traditional antitrust. What do I mean is that I don't see authorities creating new conducts or authorities uh, increasing uh, enforcement per se. I just see that there is this idea of uh, intervening where is needed. So it's not just a matter of quantity, but it's a matter of uh, checking uh, how the market is working right now in these days and where an intervention in is needed. So it's more a matter of priorities, while when it comes to the contents, I don't see big differences to the uh, compared to the enforcement strategy we, we had before. So these are just uh, quick reactions to the very interesting comments you, you raised. So Ariel, I leave you the floor. Thank you, Laura. I'll, I'll add a few thoughts to, to, to the excellent comments from, from Laura. Um, I think um, first in terms of when we think about data protection and competition, so the, the first question on, on possible collaboration. Maybe one thing that is important to highlight is the fact that the two disciplines actually have a bit of friction between them. So from a competitive perspective, what we would like is to see a lot of entry. And what we would like is often to see that platforms do not 
uh, control all the data and all the analytics. So in fact, we would like to allow smaller players to gain access to your data because what we want is for them to be able also to develop the analytics to actually develop the scale. But from a privacy and data protection perspective, we don't want that. What we want is that if someone harvests your data, they are the only ones that can use it. So there is a certain friction here because in reality, what happened is that very quickly, the leading platforms occupied the space as the controller of the data. And when we enhance privacy protection, what we are actually doing is enhance their market power and also their ability to engage in future innovation and future usage and analytics. So first point for, for all of us just to be aware is how, although we're all trying to do the same things and we're all trying to improve consumer welfare because we are approaching it from slightly different perspectives, sometimes it, make, it might make it a bit challenging where what you want to do is open the markets and someone else wants to close the market. To some extent, it's not different from the, the sometimes friction that you see between IP protection and competition law, but I think there you will see it more as a complementing disciplines. When you focus it on privacy, I think the friction can become a bit more obvious. And that, of course, impacts on the ability to collaborate, but also highlights how significant it is to have a good interagency uh, collaboration and communication. Because if you do not, if the competition agency does not engage in, in proper advocacy, you will really find yourself with policies that cancel each other out. So that's crucial. Now, whether you do it within one agency or, or, or not, this goes to the heart of the design of agencies. And there is a lot of literature and very interesting literature um, that highlights the risks of having a multi multi kind of purpose agency, what happens in those agencies, it doesn't always work. But of course, you have other examples where it does work quite well. So really, uh, I think it's one of those areas that um, it, it depends on quite a lot of factors. I don't think there is an easy answer to say whether a single agency or a dual agency um, is, is the right way forward. I will say that when, as part of the Stigler report that we released, I think more than a year ago, uh, so it was released by, as part of effort of the University of Chicago. And one of the recommendations that we made was to establish a kind of a new regulator, digital entity. And at the time, Mario Monti, was with us. And he actually made a comment which I found quite fascinating. He warned against the idea of creating new regulatory entities because he said, and I think he's absolutely right, that you have to remember also the risk of regulatory capture and the risk of, of politicizing. One thing that most competition ha agencies have, I'm saying most because it's not all, but most have is independence. So most competition agencies were built in a way that they are not directly subjected to a minister and there is a detachment from the political agenda, which gives them the ability to pick up the cases. And therefore, this is why if you think about it, if you think about lobbying, if you think about the power of the platforms, it might be that actually thinking forward, creating some things like as we have in the UK, when you have the, the unit sitting within the CMA is not a bad idea because at least you already created a unit which is independent and to some extent it is, it is shielded from uh, capture. I'm not suggested, suggesting that competition agencies are completely shielded from capture. We're all subjected to capture, not, not as a, just because there is intellectual capture. I mean, you know, we're all within an environment, but at the very least to be shielded from direct political uh, influence, uh, at least this is a benefit that you have. And maybe, um, one um, one comment on the international dimension. To some extent, when one competition agency engages, for example, in a structural remedy, the benefits will be felt across the board. But when you have one competition agency engages in behavioral remedy to the extent that the subject, the company, is able to engage in differential treatment, no one else benefits. Take, for example, Facebook. In Germany, at the moment, Facebook is under a certain level of scrutiny and requirement in terms of its treatment of data, the ability to transfer data from WhatsApp to Facebook, vice versa. In Europe, slightly different reality under the GDPR. Move now to the US, 
completely different reality. Facebook can basically, so if you are a registered user in Germany, presumably you get greater protection than if you are a registered uh, user elsewhere. So in the digital arena, because a lot of the remedies are behavioral in nature and can be distinguished from one jurisdiction to the other, we lose the ability to free ride on decisions of other jurisdictions, something that should really be on our mind. The fact that there was an interesting decision somewhere is not enough. We have to look at the type of remedy and we have to look of whether it is used in our jurisdiction. And if not, then what the local competition agencies should do is to adopt a similar decision that basically incorporate the remedy at the national level to protect itself. And to do that, cooperation, of course, is always welcome. A whole new host of uh, discussion that we can have on that. I'll, I'll end with this. Thank you very much, Ario. Thank you very much, Laura, for your interventions. And uh, there are more questions coming, uh, but uh, since we are a bit ahead of time, I also have a question. I will let this question after the comments by uh, Paula Farani and Vinicius Klein. So without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Paula Farani for her comments. Thank you, Giuliano. First of all, um, thank you, Ibrak. Thank you, Inspir, and especially Giuliano and Vinicius for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to speak alongside you um, and Professor Ariel speak uh, alongside you again. Since I have very limited, limited time, I'm going to make my comments uh, very short and hopefully controversial so everyone will pay attention. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I, I'm going to speak today just on the topic of merger enforcement in the context of big data and antitrust. In the past year, we have seen quite a few mergers in Brazil involving the acquisition of data sets or access to data because of the merger. And these mergers have largely been approved, some with a few remedies, and they have been, at least for me, particularly challenging for two reasons. First, because I feel that we do not have the appropriate tools to assess the true competitive value of data. And since merger analysis is a predictive assessment, um, we need to have trustworthy models based on experience. And I feel that this is not the case. Second, because at least in my view, data acquisition is not competition on the merits. So if a non-dominant firm will clearly gain a competitive advantage by purchasing data should this merger be approved simply because it does not reinforce or create a dominant position, which is the legal standard for barring a merger in Brazil. So that's essentially the question that I think merits a lot of attention, at least in Brazil right now. Um, the digitalization of the economy aggravates information asymmetry. I think Professor Ariel has, has gone through this extensively. And we are seeing the emergence of entirely new markets in which price is no longer the key competition element. Platforms are at the core of the digital economy have, and have influenced a growing trend of ecosystems. Ecosystems obviously are not new, but what is new, as highlighted earlier today, is the intensity and the fact that these ecosystems are able to generate, collect, process mass amounts of user data and then predict user behavior and use these predictions via dark patterns, stealth, and transform this into persistent monopoly power. And the distorted market view, which Professor Ariel talked about, um, is so pernicious. In fact, a funny story, um, a lot of you may not know this, but I started knitting a few years back because... Facebook and Instagram told me to. And, and after I picked up this hobby, I realized that the only reason why I started knitting is because I started seeing ads for this all the time. And, and I picked up a hobby that I didn't even know of that existed. So these digital ecosystems, they drive and they capture value creation, and they are subject to a broad spectrum competition that cross a variety of industries. Um, there are a lot of household ecosystem names that we're familiar with, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Netflix, et cetera. And in response, we are also seeing a growing number of conglomerate mergers and a growing awareness and interest in theories of harm arising from conglomerates, with data being a key asset in the digital economy. And especially relevant to determining a firm's dynamic capabilities, data is also at the center of the claims that competitors make about the potential harm of mergers. So dynamic capability has become one of the um, key aspects in merger analysis. So, and, and what is dynamic capability? According to Thies, uh, Pisano, and Schwen, it's the firm's ability to integrate, build, reconfigure internal and external competences 
to address rapidly changing environments. However, by the nature of conglomerate mergers, these mergers rarely create or increase a dominant position in a given relevant market. And this is where traditional antitrust analysis that is relevant market centric becomes um, almost almost uh, a, a problem in conglomerate merger analysis and big data antitrust analysis. So how should we approach these situations? Should we review our standards? And if so, how? Um, digital markets are fast, so fast paced that remedies are usually dead on arrival. And here I agree with Professor Ariel. In my view, as a policy perspective, these issues should be addressed ex ante and not exposed. So as much as possible, if an antitrust authority feels that there is a problem in a merger, it should try to intervene in an ex ante merger analysis setting and not wait for the effects on the market and then launch an investigation into whatever happened in the market afterwards. So product market centric monopoly gatekeeping or incumbency explanations provide a narrow description for the determinants of business ecosystem survival and failure. So the static analysis that is traditionally carried out in merger cases is insufficient to fully capture the dynamic competition of the ecosystem since each digital ecosystem, as Schumpeter would say, looks but subject to pressure from a broad spectrum. And this, and this broad spectrum um, is not being captured by traditional merger analysis. Uh, and this is easily, easy, is easily uh, seen. Um, one example can be seen in today's entertainment market. So while it could still be difficult to argue in Brazil, given the population's limited access to cable TV and broadband internet, that first run theater, pay-per-view movies, cable TV and streaming are, are all part of one relevant market. I think that this is a plausible argument in some jurisdictions where ecosystems such as Netflix, Hulu, cable TV, uh, first-run movie theaters are all in competition, and even certain adjacent uh, ecosystems, such as social media platforms, are encroaching and competing for attention and even providing entertainment. So to sum up my very short intervention, what I would like to share is the conclusion offered by T. and Petit in a 2020 OECD note, and it is, we are missing broad-spectrum competition. This is the takeaway that I wanted to leave with you guys today. And my question that I would like to leave, and I would like um, someone else to answer because I, I don't know how to answer it, is how does competition on the merits standard apply to non-dominant agents using data sets acquired through a merger? So that's what I leave you with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula, for your con very concise, but right on the spot comments and uh, uh, I'm sure it is very provocative. And um, I will move now to Vinicius Klein, and uh, then I will open for a discussion uh, among the audience and, and all of us. So please, uh, Vinicius, uh, you have the floor now. Thank you very much, Juliano. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with such wonderful professors after so insightful presentation. It's very hard to do any uh, comment, and I will try to be short. The idea, I think, is uh, I will try to bring this, to discuss this difference between regulation and competition in a different perspective, perspective maybe. Uh, one is about the design uh, in Usually, when you think about experimentation, about these excellent methods and things like the competition tool, I would like to us to think about if the judicial design is not is is not good, and if it's better to keep the competition discussion in administrative uh, arena, and why maybe that is uh, is a, a trend maybe because the DMA and other initiatives are in that in that path maybe it's because of legal certainty uh, maybe it's because uh, the judicial review will lack uh, the ability to deal with this experimentation or maybe it's the need for a more operational uh, economic theory because if you think about uh, the, there is no analysis effects on the DMA and there is no efficiency defense maybe uh, I would like to think it's because of the urgency of the matter 
it because uh, concepts like uh, predatory innovation are not so are not so operational that can be used and shared between commissioners and judicial and judges and people like that because I think this 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 discussion between uh, a more uh, exact approach and regulation or competition can be also translated to the uh, type of uh, competition you have uh, with more uh, more uh, role of the administrative way of thinking or with a more like U.S. traditional approach that you have to challenge things in the judiciary. I don't know how Laura and I would think about uh, this idea that uh, maybe this competition market, uh, competition in digital market is going back to more uh, administrative arena and the judiciary will lack an uh, 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 important role on that. That's that's that. Thank you, Juliano. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vinicius. And uh, well, uh, I have, have a question here that I'm going to link to another question uh, which came from, from the audience. Uh, in both uh, talks by uh, Ariel and Laura, uh, there is a specific concern about the algorithms. Uh, about, uh, algorithms, uh, they propel data, the data analytics, and algorithms are also um, in, um, key in, in, in pricing uh, as, as a pricing mechanism. So uh, there is a concern about how, uh, wh what will be the regulation tools for facing the challenge that algorithms pose, both as pricing mechanism that may, may lead to collusion and also uh, as um, mechanisms that uh, are uh, on which behavioral discrimination is, is based. So there is a recent proposal by the, the uh, European Parliament for the regulation of algorithms. And so we expect that these policies should um, converge. But uh, what I see is regarding uh, the use of algorithms for pricing, uh, we see the uh, proposal for regulation of AI uh, based on a uh, procedural mechanism, based on a risk approach. And we don't find pricing algorithms as algorithms that uh, should be classified as either forbidden or even as high risk, high risk. So they will not fall into the obligation of previous certification and all the, the documentation that will be necessary and uh, risk management systems that are proposed in this regulation. And concerning behavioral discrimination, these uh, algorithms are not only uh, accused of being uh, behaviorally, uh, that discriminate behavior, but actually that they manipulate behavior of consumers and therefore they affect consumer autonomy and uh, therefore they affect the ideal of consumer so sovereignty on, on which uh, uh, markets are based. So, and if we look at the proposal at the, uh, um, uh, at the proposal by the um, European Parliament, you find that there is a concern and, uh, and it systems which um, provide manipulation, subliminal manipulation of behavior. They are forbidden, but only to the extent they provoke some physical or psychological damage. So I would say that uh, uh, it would be to push too far to say that these algorithms uh, that provide and uh, result in, in behavioral discrimination would provoke physical or psychological damage. Then, uh, if this is true, I would say that these uh, uh, concerns raised by the antitrust discussion 
are not covered by the uh, these concerns by the un antitrust discussion on algorithms are not covered by the regulation on the the, the proposal of regulation of AI. So it's uh, more or less, uh, even though there is a concern in the discussion of the ethics of AI about monopolies and dominant firms about gatekeepers. So what is happening here, maybe the, those who are concerned about regulating AI are, are expecting a regulation by antitrust authorities and antitrust authorities maybe are uh, expecting some regulation by the, the um, uh by those who are thinking about regulating an eye. And, but there is actually a gap here since uh, these concerns are not being attacked as uh, Ariel has uh, uh, um, brightly um, discussed by the algorithm uh, tacit collusion. Yeah? And there is one question for the audience by Gabriel Fernandes, uh, Gabriel Fernandes, who, uh, uh, asks about the role of online platforms in electoral periods. So he's also concerned about the manipulation of behavior, but particularly in electoral periods. And he's asking whether antitrust law should be a tool for addressing this kind of political issue or should it be uh, tackled by another uh, regulatory instrument. Sorry, so, do you want to go first? Or? Uh, maybe now Ariel could go first and then you, Laura. Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for all the comments and really interesting and, and quite challenging questions. I'll, um, I'll pick on a few, a few things that I, I kind of find. Uh, I'll, I'll start from the end because it's always easier. Um, um, manipulation in, in, uh, in, in a period of elections. Personally, if you view the market for ideas as a market, and if you understand that the idea of dynamic of competition is also relevant for, as a foundation for democracy, undistorted competition between ideas, then you could apply competition law ideas to that. That takes us to the, the heart of what competition law is about. In Europe, competition law is an instrument, among other things, that can be used also to advance plurality relatively easy to think of it here as a competition question, would be much more challenging in another jurisdiction. But even if it's not a competition issue, I know most of us are competition practitioners or lawyers or economists, it is still an issue that needs to be addressed and might be even better addressed through a regulatory uh, approach. The issue is first the realization that we have a problem. And just to give you a hint, I mean, there is a, a fascinating research that was conducted in the US. A lot of the manipulation is manipulation that we can actually trace. So we understand there's a lot of behavioral research on dark patterns and manipulations and how we react. And there is quite a lot of information. But there was a very interesting research, for example, that just looked at how you can manipulate thinking when you deal with autocomplete. You know, when you go and Google something and you write the query, it tends to autocomplete. And what they've done is they manipulated the autocomplete ahead of the Trump-Clinton uh, elections. And when you typed Hillary Clinton, what they've done is they autocompleted very negative uh, statements. You know, is something, something negative. And when you, you wrote Trump... Have, you don't have to, to say what was the complete... What was no, no, of course I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't risk it. And when you, and the same on the other side, I wouldn't risk. But what they wrote. So with Trump, also they autocomplete, but it was positive. And what they checked is how this affected. You know, it's it. It was a sophisticated uh, research, but how it affected opinion. And they realized that because our subconscious assumption is that autocomplete reflects what the majority of people were looking for. So when you saw an autocomplete that was negative, you assumed that the majority of people are looking for that negativity and that affected your opinion. Why am I telling you that story? Because it's not even something that we can trace. So there are so many things that just go below our awareness. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just the world in which we are. I think it's very interesting, very challenging. On the earlier uh, question, um, 
part of it were on dark patterns, part of it uh, on the fact that we don't prohibit pricing algorithm. I'll just say that this is exactly the challenge. We don't want to prohibit pricing algorithms. I mean, they are essential to so much of, of what we have around. If you have dynamic pricing, it can be extremely valuable. If there is oversupply, limited demand, you will get cheaper product. If you have personalized pricing and you're a poor student, you will get a better deal than someone who is more wealthy. That's not a bad thing. So how do you distinguish between elements that are actually positive and between the fact that these same algorithms can be used as part of a strategy that would extract more money from people, that would move from price discrimination into an almost perfect price discrimination, that will engage in manipulation, behavioral manipulation, rather than just advertising. That's exactly the challenge. The challenge is, and that's a challenge that we're familiar with from competition law, the challenge of being able to intervene without distorting, without causing more harm than good. And this is why it is such a fascinating but also challenging area uh, for policy, because it's not easy. Um, in terms of regulatory tools, um, yeah, there are lots of proposals, lots of um, approaches. There are some assumptions that we make that uh, the individuals are responsible for the algorithms and for their operation, that if you execute an AI in a certain market, whatever happens, it's your responsibility. So you can make some legal assumptions that will help you retain some control. So people cannot just rely on a black box argument um, to justify their, uh, their behavior. I mean, lots of good comments. I think I should end with that and because um, there's just too, too much to, to, to cover. And Laura probably wants to cover uh, some aspects as well. Yeah, Laura, I would just thank you very much, uh, Ariel. I would just like to specify a little bit to Laura because she uh, has discussed about the responsibility of uh, uh, around pricing algorithms. And uh, the European uh, uh, proposal of regulation, actually, it doesn't uh, uh, forbids high-risk AI, but it creates a, a, a group of uh, procedural obligations to control the life cycle of the AI system. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, La uh, Laura, if uh, um, pricing algorithms should or should not uh, be um, uh, controlled uh, in the way which is proposed uh, by the, by the um, uh, European uh, AI regulation, uh, proposal of regulation actually, or, um, or if this, is, this will be uh, tackled by antitrust uh, policies. Thank you, thank you, Juliana. I think, yeah, that's extremely linked and extremely relevant for my uh, reasoning before. So the starting point is indeed the price algorithm, as Ariel was mentioning, uh, of course, shouldn't be forbidden per se. I mean, if we think about traditional markets, nobody prevents you from checking the prices applied by competitors and even more in the online world, it could be a more tailored and more uh, specific price algorithm based on users and so on. But um, this idea of procedural obligations, I mean, the starting point is uh, if we decide that competition law should intervene in the sense of preventing uh, some of those price algorithms, we should discuss about the need of changing the agreement, the definition of agreement. So the definition of agreement uh, of Article 101 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union or the respective definition in other legislation. So at what condition we can consider that there is a meeting of minds and then there is a proper collusion. collusion. While, um, so if we decide that a certain condition we should pursue price algorithms, I think we should make some amendment of the definition of agreements and ethical collusive agreement. While when it comes to procedural obligations, uh, this is exactly what uh, I think could be uh, midway in the sense of, uh, let's say, what I brought in my slide over simplifying as antitrust by design. So asking those uh, uh, using price algorithms to uh, set few uh, features, to uh, adopt few corrective mechanisms just to be sure that they, they don't lose control of their algorithms. Again, this kind of 
second idea of changing a little bit the definition of agreement, because in general terms, as far as there is no meeting of minds, you shouldn't be sanctioned for what your agreements are making. So I think procedural obligations can really be a good alternative and something that somehow is limiting, let's say, the risk of uh, proper collusion and undetectable collusion in the digital markets. However, this is still linked to a need of changing the definition of agreement and deciding that companies are liable for more than they're asked for offline. So... But still, I think procedural obligations can be uh, a good a good answer. And considering the time, I think I will stop myself here, and because Aaron was exhaustive on. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. We have one last question here from uh, Bruno Brasi Castro. I think that this question would fit uh, um, Paula Farani's talk. Uh, he's asking whether there there should be an update in market definition uh, methodologies or in methodologies for defining market power to handle data. Oh, I, I'm seeing here that, uh, no, Paula Farron is here, okay. Uh, so Paula, no, I think she's off. So maybe uh, we, could address uh, to, to all this question. The, the question then in the end is uh, whether there should be a new definition of uh, a new methodology for defining market power in um, what related to uh, those cases which are um, uh, focused or driven by the uh, accumulation of data. Um, uh, uh, Laura, if you would like to comment on that. Oh, yes, of course. So um, when it comes to uh, the um, accumulation uh, of, uh, of data, I mean, so uh, the general uh, comment I, I, I would like to make here is um, that uh, we shouldn't, you know, uh, sanction uh, per se uh, or uh, pursue per se those uh, players uh, that thanks to their uh, analytical uh, tools uh, collect data and through, uh, let's say, um, engine can can extract extract info and, and ameliorate their services. So a very general comment I would like to make is uh, that uh, competition law uh, should be kept in its uh, dimension of uh, pursuing all, only those conducts that are exclusionary or abusive or that entail a cartel, while in all other uh, cases we can think about policy move regulation based. So that's a general uh, remark. And, and sorry, I was a little bit distracted. But, so I don't know if Ariel has... Yeah, great. Uh, and um, thank you very much. Uh, Ariel and Vinicius would like to make final comments on, on that and... Um, just just to say that as far as, as market definition is concerned, I think once you appreciate that there has been a change in the competition dynamic, then that implies that there should be a change in the way that we define uh, markets. Um, it is relevant uh, in general or already in merger control many times we understand that market definition isn't always uh, the starting the starting way. We're looking at other things to understand the dynamics between companies. And I think this is a trend that the emphasis of traditional market definition is a trend that is uh, now well accepted. Digitalization probably um, just accelerates our understanding that um, it is more complicated than a zero one story that we're telling ourselves and that uh, competitive pressures are not limited to products that they're, they're, you know, to go well beyond that. Yes. Uh Thank you very much, Ariel, for your comments. And uh, Vinicius would like to make some final comments. Oh, no, thank you for the opportunity and say that I agree that we need to do a change. And uh, I think that this change can be very promising because maybe if you change the, the methodology for digital markets, the spillover effect, I think, will, wrap it, will happen and you're going to have a change for maybe uh, the whole competition law and competition policy reasoning. 
Well, thank you very much. We are already in our limit of time. Uh, I would like uh, to thank again uh, all the participants and uh, to thank the speakers, Vinicius, Ariel, Laura and Paula. Uh, it was uh, really enjoyable. I, I, I have enjoyed a lot. I hope all the audience has also enjoyed as I have. I think it was a very interesting discussion. I would like also to thank uh, Paulo Forkin for his uh, participation and uh, and and I'd like to thank also Ibrak and Inspert for making this uh, webinar uh, possible, uh, which was really fruitful from uh, from my point of, of view. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a Bye -bye. good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.